Hey everyone, it's Hamish from the Young Investors Podcast. Myself and Brandon are excited to bring you your weekly rundown of the latest business and investing news from around the world. A quick reminder before we get started, any advice provided by Brandon is general and does not consider your financial situation, needs or objectives, so consider whether it's appropriate for you. Brandon van der Kolk is authorized to provide general financial product advice in Australia and is authorized representative number 1305795 of Guideway Financial Services Proprietary Limited, AFSL number 420367. Please see the description box for Brandon's financial services guide. Past performance is not a reliable indication of future investment returns. But with that said, let's get into another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the Young Investors Podcast for yet another episode. Hey Mishota, what is going on, my friend? I'm uh, I'm going well here. Uh, I thought last night I decided to stay up till 3 a.m. watching a chess tournament and it <laughs> sounded like a good idea at the time and now I'm regretting it. So uh, that's uh, that, that's my morning. I'm a little bit sleepy and we're working with uh, a little bit of lag this morning on the connection as seems to pop up every three or four episodes. Um, so yeah, apologies if there's a little bit of a, a delay between the connection, but um, yeah, I'm going well. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. <laughs> no, that was an Okay, it's not that bad. <laughs> no, it's not that bad. Uh, yeah, I'm doing really well. I'm a little bit tired as well um, today, but that's because I've had a busy couple of days. I recently uh, I went up to Sydney and um, I was super stoked. I got to be a part of uh, Steak's New York Slices campaign, which is um, which yeah. is like a couple of, well, it's a series of short form kind of uh, videos on Instagram and I'm not sure where else it's going, but uh, it's basically helping people get started investing in the US market. So they were really nice and reached out to me. That Stake have been long-term supporters of my channel. Um, I think they were the first or second uh, sponsor that ever reached out to me on my channel. But anyway, long story short, they invited me up to Sydney to be in the first two episodes of their New York Slices campaign, which, uh, which yeah. are now out. And uh, I'm not sure how I'll link to them, but I'll try and link to them somehow in the show notes. Um, or you can just head over to either my Instagram, new, new.money.official, or Stake's Instagram, which is Hello Stake, and you can actually watch them. So they're only like a minute long, but uh, it was really cool. I had a great team of people um, filming away up there. Um, it was a really, really good experience, actually. It was really fun, and we ate a lot of pizza as well, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking that, like, how much pizza did you go through recording this thing? But um, yeah, they they, they yeah. came out. They, they they looked really polished. Um, yeah, go go check yeah, them thanks, out, man. everyone. Um, uh, yeah, they they came out really good. So, are there more that are coming out, or was it? Is yeah, it just there's the more, but I'm just in the first couple, and then they've got other people oh, for okay. for the other ones. So I think there's a, gotcha. a someone from Morningstar. I think is going on one of them. I think maybe right. Bryce and Alec from Equity Mates are going on a couple, um, and maybe some more people as well. I'm I'm not too sure. I just I just knew about kind of the first two episodes that I was part of. But yeah, that was really yeah, cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks very yeah. much, Steak, for ongoing support. And thanks for having me up to Sydney and, and including me as a, as a part of the campaign. Uh, it was really fun. But yes, Hamish, Hamish, Hamish. Oh, we've got some stuff to talk about. The Trump news yes, broke overnight. Do. So uh, we, we got to talk through the Trump news. Um, yep. I'm also going to talk about what's going on in the world of food delivery apps because, as you might, as you might guess, Hamish, it's not looking good. And then, what no. have you got to talk about for this week? I'm going to talk about the uh, the, the big seafood chain uh, in the US, Red Lobster, filed for bankruptcy, and this was about a week and a half ago. But um, I've been diving into the story over the last couple of weeks, and it's uh, or the last week or so, and it's an absolutely crazy story. So I want to go through that. Um, and then we've got an update or well, not an update. We've got a story on, uh, orange juice and, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> we've bad, got an bad update on orange juice. Welcome back to the yeah, orange juice podcast. Yeah, this, everyone. Is the, this, this is the orange juice <laughs> section. <laughs> no, we don't have an update. We have a story on, uh, on, on orange juice and, uh, yeah, it's bad news. If you're, uh, if you're, uh, if you drink orange juice, damn. Well, that sucks because I like orange juice, <laughs> but we will get to that. Hamish, we've got to start at the top. We've got to start with yeah. this uh, Donald Trump news. Have you seen what's happened overnight? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not super up to date. So yeah, give me some of the details. But um, yeah, I've, I've certainly seen the, the headlines. Yeah, well, that's pretty, that's that's what I'd seen before I read this article as well. Um, and I, I kind of want to preface this by saying that um, 
that I included this story not to be political at all because I don't think either of us like to be overly political and this is not a political podcast either. Um, We don't tend to give political opinion. We kind of just like to talk about the world of business and investing, but this is an interesting story in the world of business. Um, And that story, as you might have already seen, is that Trump was found guilty on all 34 counts uh, in his hush money trial Uh, which is a historic first for the former U.S. president. He's the first former president um, to be found guilty of a crime. So it says here, the article says, a New York jury on Thursday found former President Donald Trump guilty of all 34 felony charges of falsifying business records related to a hush money payment to porn star Stormy Daniels by his then personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, before the 2016 election. Trump, who is 77, is the first US president to be convicted of any crime. He faces three other pending criminal cases. Uh, His sentencing for the hush money case was scheduled for July 11th at 10 a.m. by Manhattan Supreme Court Judge Juan Merchan. Um, That is just days before the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, where the twice impeached Trump is set to be formally confirmed as the GOP's presidential nominee. Uh, Trump, who remains free without bail, faces a maximum possible punishment of four years in prison for each count. Although Merchan, 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 I'm not quite sure how to pronounce um, that that last name, is not bound to sentence him to any prison time. Uh, Trump is certain to appeal the verdict. Hamish, this is um, this is an interesting story, and I might talk a little bit more about how it came to be in a, in a minute. But I think it's such an interesting story because even though all this has happened, I actually personally don't think it will change much in terms of the election. (laughs) I think the people who are going to vote for Trump are already going to vote for Trump. And I think the people who... I think you could actually just run this election now and nothing would change pretty much. (laughs) But, But what do you think on it? I don't think it really does change anything, to be honest. I don't know. I think there's... Maybe there's some people who see this and then maybe they're on the fence and they decide not to vote for him. But then there's also people who like, they probably think that this is, that this has been like a targeted campaign against someone who's trying to run for president again. And therefore those people might just double down and yes, I'm definitely voting for him now. So it it could go, you know, there's like a mix, but it is kind of a crazy, it is a crazy situation where you've got, um, you know, all these charges going against this person who's, who's one of the, he's, he's going to be the Republican nominee and then we're going to have the election. And, you know, if he gets nominated, he'll be able to, um, pardon himself of all of these crimes, essentially. Um, so really, it's just really? crazy That's to think, wild. which, which is just a crazy, it is just a crazy situation to think that someone can be, you know, found guilty of a number of, you know, I mean, they're pretty non-serious crimes, but a number of crimes and then can still run and be president. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's insane. It'll be, it'll be fascinating to see if he does get any jail time because I, I was doing a bit of reading and I don't know a huge amount of this about this stuff, but I think they're all class E felonies. So that's like the lowest level of felony. It's very close to being like a misdemeanor, which is like a very low level crime. And they're, they're non, it's a nonviolent crime. And they're all, all 34 charges are related to the same, basically the same incidents. Uh, it's just 34 moments where a document was falsified to for this particular um, hush money payment. So yeah, I think it would be surprising if there was jail time, but who knows? Um, I guess we'll see. Yeah. And I guess for those that are wondering kind of what happened, if you maybe don't know, because I I didn't know until recently, because I honestly don't follow this sort of stuff very much. Um, So the former president was found guilty of, yeah, as Hamish said, falsifying business records that were described as legal expense payment, legal expenses payments by him and the Trump organization to Cohen to reimburse the former fixer for uh, the $130,000 payment Cohen personally gave Daniels before the 2016 election. So Cohen and Daniels both testified that the money was to prevent her from selling to media outlets her story of having sex with Trump one time in 2006, months after his wife Melania uh, Trump gave birth to their son Baron Trump. Cohen said Trump directed him to pay Daniels to prevent her from damaging his chance of winning the White House in 2016. Uh, Trump's demeanor did not change during the uh, reading of the verdict, which came out at 5.05 p.m. after jurors in the state court deliberated for fewer than 10 hours over two days. His son, Eric uh, Trump, looked angry after the jury foreman uh, repeatedly said guilty to each count as it was read. 
Um, so there we go, Hamish. <laughs> yeah, there we thir- go. 34 is brutal. <laughs> and on the uh, 13th charge of falsifying business records, guilty. And on the and 27th on the... charge, like, how yeah. long does that go for? <laughs> that's a, that's a long read. And on the read. 28th count. <laughs> No, oh no sorry guilty <laughs> not guilty just kidding <laughs> just kidding got him <laughs> um anyway i've got i've got a couple of responses from both trump and uh, biden's camp as well um t- tale of two two stories i guess trump what did he say he said quote i'm a very innocent man <laughs> this was Makes a disgrace sense. he said this was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt And he said, the real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people and they know what happened here and everybody knows what happened here. So that's very Trump-like. Very Trump-like. Biden, uh, the campaign of uh, President Joe Biden in a statement minutes after the verdict said, uh, the threat Trump poses to our democracy has never been greater. In New York today, we saw that no one is above the law. Donald Trump has always mistakenly believed he would never face consequences for breaking the law for his own personal gain. But today's verdict does not change the fact that the American people face a simple reality. There is still only one way to keep Donald Trump out of the Oval Office, and that's at the ballot box. Convicted felon or not, Trump will be the Republican nominee for president. So they're pretty much saying this is crazy, but you still got to vote him out. Trump being Trump, I guess. I do, I do want to say, like, I, I don't mean to sway anyone's kind of political opinion. I'm not, not trying to influence anyone's political opinion. I, I'm not – this doesn't even affect us. Well, it does in an indirect way because we live in Australia, but it's not like we're Americans and we're, we actually have a have an interest or an invested stake in the matter. Um, so, yeah, take it all with a grain of salt. Obviously, this this – there's always political bias where if you look, this article from CNBC was probably written with some form of polit- political bias. Um, so we don't, yeah. we definitely don't mean to to do anything but report the news. But that was some pretty uh, pretty big breaking news overnight, Hamish Hodder. Yeah. Any yeah, any more crazy. thoughts on the matter? Um, no, I don't think I have any strong opinions either way on on the whole situation um, in particular. And it's not some, some something that I've been following super closely either. So. Um, yeah, it, it, but again, it's going to be a fascinating, uh, election in, uh, in, in November. Um, yep. That given, it is Hamish. You know, every, every, given the build up, given the pregame, <laughs> the pregame entertainment, this is, this is just yeah. pregame entertainment. Now we get the, the main event yeah, coming yeah. up soon. Ho, ho, ho. We are so lucky. It is a bit of a meme at this point, isn't it though? I, I'm sorry, but like the, the, just American politics in general, it's, it's crazy just how, I don't know. It's, it's, it feels like, it, it feels to me anyway, like it's more of a TV show than real life. Like it feels like watching what happens in the American political race feels like a drama as opposed to like, this is for, you know, the presidency of the world's largest democracy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. It is crazy. It does feel like it genuinely could like the whole story of this, even just like the last eight years of, of us politics could genuinely be a good like drama comedy. (laughs) Yeah. Like they don't have to change anything. They don't have to embellish anything. The the story is fine as it is. Yeah. And that would be a good show. Like I would watch that show. Um, So yeah, it it is crazy. Sometimes. Anyway, Hamish, that's all I had to say for the Trump stuff. Uh, we'll see what happens. Watch this space. Uh, what have you yeah. got to talk about? Yeah, I want to talk about this red lobster bankruptcy because, yeah, as I said, this happened a bit over a week ago and uh, I didn't take too much notice of it when it first, when the news first broke. But then I started reading into it a little bit and it's kind of a fascinating story. So, I mean, it's a bankruptcy in of itself. So I want to talk through um, kind of Red Lobster as a business and then just briefly and, and kind of what happened. But um, yeah, towards the end of, uh, of Red Lobster's life, there's some very interesting details that um, make this a very unique uh, kind of bankruptcy uh, uh, situation. So um, just to give a, maybe a little bit of a background on Red Lobster itself, just for maybe people who, who are unaware, I wasn't super aware of it. Um, but uh, basically it was the largest seafood chain in the U.S., uh, it was founded in 1968 by William Darden, um, and they basically operated about 700 restaurants. More, they basically had about 700 restaurants for for most of the early 2000s until recently, um, doing about kind of 2.2 to 2.5 billion dollars in revenue. So it wasn't some um, you know 
ama- you know, it's, it's no McDonald's or, or, or a Starbucks or something like that, but um, it was a pretty solid, consistent, you know, uh, restaurant chain um, generating, you know, a fa- fairly similar amount of revenue kind of year by year for, for at least for, the, for you know, the, the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and uh, a little bit of a background on like the history of, uh, of, of, of Red Lobster. Um, so yeah, it was founded by William Darden. And then in 1970, it was bought by General Mills, um, who was kind of uh, going through the process of acquiring a number of restaurant chains. They also owned kind of Olive Garden and, and a number of other ones. Um, and General Mills kind of put all of these restaurants in a category or a segment um, that they called uh, Darden Restaurants. Um, which, uh, if that sounds familiar, it's uh, now obviously a public company uh, because uh, it was spun off into its own public company in 1995. Um, and then, kind of for for you know most of the early 2000s, it was just kind of a fine restaurant chain. The story starts to get really interesting in 2014, and in 2014 is kind of uh, where things start to happen. Um, ownership kind of changes hands and um, things start to kind of go wrong for, for, for the chain. So in 2014, uh, Red Lobster was sold to Golden Gate Capital in a $2.1 billion deal. Um, and uh, the, the terms of this deal were really, really not great for, for Red Lobster. Um, <clears throat> so a part of the deal, the Golden Gate Capital also made a lease back deal with American Realty Capital, where essentially uh, once they'd acquired uh, 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 Red Lobster, they sold the land under the restaurants to this real estate company and then essentially got a master lease agreement where um, they'd they'd now be paying rent essentially for all of their restaurants. So they got $1.5 billion up front and that kind of funded this acquisition. Uh, but at the same time, they basically straddled uh, Red Lobster with these enormous <laughs> rent payments that they would have to pay <laughs> annually, which they weren't paying before because they just owned the land. Um, right. So, so you know, you know, classic, classic private equity kind of stuff. You know, come in and absolutely destroy uh, what was kind of a, <laughs> a, a, a reasonably fine business. Um, and some of the numbers behind this are kind of crazy. So by twenty twenty three. Red Lobster's lease payments were $190 million annually. And to put wow. that in perspective, in that year, they had a net loss of $73 million. So oh, wow. essentially, if this, if this lease back deal wasn't made, they were probably a pretty profitable company. Um, we, we don't have kind of detailed financials of, of, of uh, whether, how profitable they were uh, before they were paying rent you know, before this kind of lease back deal went through. Uh, but given that they only lost $73 million in 2023 and they were paying $200 million in rent, I, I think it's pretty safe to assume that um, that they were a profitable business and, and, you know, that contributed kind of in a meaningful way to, to it basically just being an unprofitable business that, that, that couldn't, mm. couldn't operate. Hamish, hey, so that deal's <clears throat> not looking that great anymore, is it? No, well, it was good for um, it was good for Golden Gate Capital, who it's true. <laughs> basically they uh, you know, yeah, as I said, they paid two point one billion dollars to to buy the company, but they got one point five billion immediately for the land, so they really only paid six hundred million dollars for, for for this restaurant chain, um, mm. and they were able to pull out most of the money. They squeezed all of the money out of the uh, out of uh, out out of the chain, which was in the land, apparently, <laughs> um, uh, uh, pretty pretty quickly. Um, but that's not even kind of the main crazy part of this story. That's kind of like one of oh, the, it's the that, appetizer. That's one of the, yeah, that's that's the appetizer. <laughs> yeah, that's the appetizer. Uh, that's the cocktail shrimp. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, so, so you know, all of this is coming from the bankruptcy filing. That was one of the main kind of contributors that was mentioned as to, to as to why they they filed for bankruptcy. Um, and the other one is is what happened next. So in 2016. Uh, a company called Thai Union bought 49% of Red Lobster for $575 million. Um, so, so basically now you had Golden Gate Capital who had 51% control and Thai Union had 49%. And uh, Thai Union is a seafood supplier. They've actually been supplying Red Lobster with shrimp for 30 years. So the, they're a longtime supplier, have a strong relationship with Red Lobster. Um, and uh, and now they wanted a piece. They wanted a, they wanted a, they actually said they, 
wanted to have kind of a direct to consumer channel to basically be able to sell, essentially sell seafood directly to the consumer through, through this kind of restaurant chain. Um, and so, so they acquired 49%. And at the time, Red Lobster, now we do get year by year financials on, on Red Lobster. Um, and we can see that they were unprofitable. Um, and it basically just continued to get worse. So this is in, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, it was just an unprofitable business at this point. Again, probably largely part in part due to these rent payments that they're now having to pay. Then 2020 rolls around. And uh, of course, the pandemic happens and all of, you know, restaurants have to shut down. So particularly for an unprofitable restaurant like Red Lobster, <clears throat> it's uh, not very good. And they actually lost $130 million uh, in that year, uh, Ooh, which is, uh, so, so yeah, it was, a, it was a very painful year. I think revenue dropped by 30%, uh, but as is the case with these kind of thin margin or negative margin in this case, restaurant chains, even a 30% drop can, can, you know, their losses went from, I think it was like 20 million a year to, to 130 million at this point. Mm, and, uh, so essentially in 2020, of course, Red Lobster is kind of near bankruptcy. Um, and so Thai union actually teams up with some other investors and they buy the remaining 51% of the company from Golden Gate Capital. Um, so now Thai union has a controlling stake, um, and, uh, and, and uh, they implement some fantastic changes and the company revives and um, all is well. And that's, that's the oh, end of the story. Oh, nice. Um, all right. <clears throat> well, uh, what have I got to talk about next, Hamish? Let's... I have a feeling that did not happen. No, that's not exactly what happened. Um, <laughs> but they did start making some big changes. Um, they basically fired a lot of 20, 30, even 40-year veteran managers at the store um, there was a bunch of others that also started to resign uh, because of what the new management was doing. And Thai Union basically just started putting in their own executives. Um, so between like 2020 and 2022, they were just basically swapping out all of the uh, executives for their, for their own people. And in particular, in 2022, they put Paul Kenny in as CEO. Um, and he made some rather strange decisions. Um, so basically Red Lobster one of the main things that they would buy from suppliers is shrimp. And they had three shrimp suppliers. So basically they had different suppliers competing for, for the best rates, which makes sense, right? So they can, they can, um, yeah, make them compete against each other. Um, so one of the things that Kenny did was he cut ties with two of the suppliers. So of course. Red Lobster was, of course, yeah, as you would, right? Because that makes perfect sense. Um, and that basically left Red Lobster to supply to get to getting all of their shrimp exclusively from Thai Union, um, so that was kind of the first strange thing that they did. That was kind of not very good for Red Lobster. The bankruptcy filing notes that their costs rose significantly after this, um, because there was no competition. All of their shrimp was being supplied from uh, 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 from from Thai Union. Um, and so uh, in 2023, rolls around, uh, Red Lobster is still burning cash. Their debt's rising. Um, so, they're, you know, they're, they're in a pretty bad situation. Kenny then launches an all-you-can-eat shrimp deal in <laughs> May 2023. And, uh, and so, you know, th these deals are pretty common for Red Lobster. They do kind of one, one or two of these every single year for a few weeks. Um, right. It's either shrimp or, or crab. But this okay. deal was absolutely insane. So the deal was $20 for all you can eat. And Kenny, the CEO, made it a permanent menu item, which had wow. never been done before because it's it it burns money to, to offer this deal. So, so putting it as a permanent menu item is absolutely insane. And the other executives told him it was a bad idea. And in the three months that followed after this deal... Uh, Red Lobster's cash fell from 100 million to 69 million, and then by the uh -oh. end of the year, it had fallen to under 30 million dollars. Wow. And less than a year after this promotion, uh, <laughs> they filed for they filed for bankruptcy. Um, so I know this is a really long story, but just to give like a summary of 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 what basically this means, there's currently an investigation, and this is in the bankruptcy filing, into whether Thai Union did the endless shrimp deal on purpose to basically try and pull some money out of a dying chain. 
Um, because if, uh, oh, if, yeah. if you could imagine, if, if they believed that Red Lobster was going to fail and that the losses essentially were going to go to the creditors, that the, the, the debts were just going to be, the, the creditors were going to take over the company. One way that Thai Union could get some money out of the out of the business at the end would be to run an endless shrimp promotion yeah. and uh, basically force Red Lobster to buy an enormous amount of shrimp at loss making prices uh, to basically move some money out of uh, out of Red Lobster and into into Thai Union, um, mm. which is a an absolutely fascinating story. Um, yeah. That uh, interest, that, very yeah. interesting. That's yeah. I wonder if uh, if they could even go one step further and have a look at like what what prices they were paying. What what prices was Red Lobster paying for Thai Union's uh, you know shrimp? Um, that would be interesting. I'm not sure if that uh, whether there's a big discrepancy. Maybe they were getting charged more than say the market rate. In which case, that kind of backs up that. That argument, but yeah. I, I don't know. But that's that's actually a really clever thinking. As maybe what was his name, Mister Kenny, coming in? Was it Ken? Is that what you said? Paul Kenny. Kenny. Paul Kenny. He's come in and said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna squeeze as much cash over to uh, to my business in uh, Thai Union as possible because Red Lobster ain't got a hope in hell of surviving." Yeah, and and so the the bankruptcy filing also makes reference of they're doing another investigation into the in store promotion of this deal, which apparently according to the filing, was way ex- more excessive than normal. So normally they wouldn't do that much in-store promotion because it's an unprofitable menu item. So once people are in the store, you actually don't want them to, to order the all-you-can-eat shrimp. You want them to order the other items. It's, yeah. it's, it's something you would promote outside of the store to bring people in. Uh, but apparently oh, sorry, they're doing we're out an of enormous... Yeah, exa- exactly. Oops, but you can eat something else. But apparently they were doing an enormous amount of in-store promotion, like pushing people towards... Uh, to towards this deal, um, which uh, which kind of adds to the to the story of you know why you know why were they pushing people so much to this deal when they were already burning so much money? Mm. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a fascinating story. This again just happened over the last week or so. Um, the bankruptcy filings will kind of go through the courts and 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 maybe we'll get some conclusions on and some answers around some of these. Uh, investigations but um yeah fascinating story yeah that is wild it will be interesting to see what uh if there's more of an investigation into that and uh what they discover because it does seem like you're exactly right if you have a loss making uh item on your menu you don't go and promote it it's like supermarkets they don't put milk at the front of the supermarket do they they put it in the yes. back corner yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah they, exactly you have to right. walk the furthest to go and get the milk out of any other product because the, it doesn't make it doesn't make uh, supermarkets any money. So yeah. yes, yeah. very interesting, Hamish. We shall see on that one. All right, shall we move on to to the next news story? Yeah, yeah. What All have right. we got? I'm gonna, well, this this one's very very short, but I, I wanted to take the time to talk about food delivery apps a little bit because um, this is more more of a headline news story than anything else. Um, but I thought it was quite a shocking headline. Um, We're talking about food delivery apps. It says here, leading online food delivery groups in Europe and the US have racked up now more than 20 billion in combined operating losses since they went public after a fierce battle for market share. So shares in Deliveroo, Just Eat Takeaway, Delivery Hero and DoorDash, the four largest standalone publicly listed food delivery businesses in the US and Europe are all trading well below their pre-pandemic era, uh, their their pandemic era peaks. Sorry, not pre-pandemic for these businesses, their pandemic era peaks, um, as investors scrutinize their business models. So following a period of pandemic lockdown-fueled growth, the four companies are now contending with a tougher macroeconomic environment that has hit consumers. Uh, As they make a renewed push to demonstrate profitability to investors, their cumulative annual operating losses have now hit over $20 billion, $20.3 billion, calculations by the Financial Times and industry analysts uh, that Delivery.World found. Um, so the, the figure covers the seven years since Deliveroo, Delivery Hero and DoorDash went public and after Just Eat Takeaway was created following a merger in 2020. Uh, it also includes substantial write downs related to acquisitions and stock based compensation. Um, yeah. But actually this, this, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you go. 
All I was going to say is I'll add one more to this. I know it's not in that list because um, Uber includes their rideshare app as well, but the retained earnings of Uber, uh, so all of the kind of retained profits over time, the, the accrued profits in the business is negative $30 billion since, uh, <laughs> since I think either they were founded or since the, they went public. So essentially, mm. what what does that mean? Essentially, they've accrued thirty billion dollars in losses. Like there's been, they've needed thirty billion dollars of investor money they've that they've it. just set on fire, um, yep. completely <laughs> set on fire. So, oh, um, dear. Uh, yeah, yeah I it's, mean, it's fair to include. I think it's fair to include Uber in this debate, even though they include ride delivery, because even like the the rides, it's still that similar business model which I'll talk about in a second. It's, it's the gig economy business model that, that honestly isn't working. It's, it's, not, it's not a profitable venture. Um, so I, I wanted to, this actually sparked me to actually look into just how much these share prices are down uh, for these four businesses that were listed in the article. So Deliveroo, I looked, is down six. These are all from their 2021 peaks, by, uh, by the way. So Deliveroo is down 64%. Just Eat Takeaways down 88%. These are stock prices, down 88%. Delivery Hero stock down 78% and DoorDash down 55%. So, yeah, if you're an, if you're an investor, if you're seeing, ooh, pandemic-fueled growth, let's get in, stock prices are going up and up and you bought at the highest points in 2021, <clears throat> it's not looking good for you, Hamish. It's not looking good. Um and I think it's it's fair to say, um, well, now the reason that this is coming to light now is because there's so much scrutiny on their on the business models of these ride sharing apps, these delivery services, um, because we're now facing quite a, a, a difficult uh, macroeconomic environment. The interest rates are high, which makes it you know people are trying to save money as opposed to spend money. You know, during the pandemic, we all got locked up and given money. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's like, okay, I have to go. I can't go and get food, but I need food, and I've got money to spend on food. So that's where the the um, that's where the the hype came from with all these stocks. But yeah, now people are generally not spending as much, and also with these uh, businesses that are loss making, eventually if they don't you know, change things, they run out of money. So a lot of their early days of their business is to continually raise more money. And of course, that becomes harder in a high interest rate environment. So all eyes are on these businesses now, and it's not looking particularly good. Investors want them to focus on profitability to get them through this this kind of tougher patch. Um, and it's really bringing them to the spotlight. Um, and I, I wanted to talk about, I guess, the fundamentals of why this business doesn't really work. And it, it really goes back to the business model, which is tough, which is tough because even if, you're, even if you're not super profitable at the start, if your business model is sound, then generally you come out okay. You know, you, you eventually get profitable. But we've come from a, a situation where, you know, back, back, back before these apps existed, for example, if you want to take away, you would head out to your shopping center you'd go to the Chinese place and you'd just buy some food and you'd take it home and you'd eat it. Whereas now, so that there's, there's, there's one, one person that really needs to be paid there and that's, that's the, um, and that's the Chinese restaurant, right? Whereas now you've got essentially three in these, in these instances, you've got three stakeholders that all need to be paid. You've still got, uh, the restaurant and then you've got, the driver or the rider or whatever. And then you've actually got the end business, like the Deliveroo. So all of a sudden, instead of just having one stakeholder that needs to make money, now you've got three. And you're trying to make that equation work on an item that can't be too expensive because you know, you know, if you start, if, if I say, hey, I can get you a, what do you want? Do you want some um, pad thai down from the Thai shop? Oh, that's going to be $50. You're not going to buy it. <laughs> You're just not going to buy yeah. it. Well, maybe yeah. fifty dollars is what what makes sense for the restaurant, the driver, and the business, and the rideshare business or the delivery app business to make sense. But you're just not going to do it. So it's an incredibly yeah. tough business model to make sense. Yeah, and there's not really that much. Some people might disagree with this, but I don't really think there's much scale economics in this business because, to some extent, yes, if there's more people ordering more drivers, yet yeah, technically a driver can do 
pick up multiple food items and, and that saves, you know, some time. Um, maybe it saves some money as they scale. But for the most part, um, the restaurant, every time there's an extra meal that's being purchased, if there's more meals being purchased, there's more, they still have to pay the restaurant the same cut. And for the most part, they're still probably going to be paying the drivers the same cut. So there's not really any scale kind of, there's, there's very limited scale economics in this business. And there's no driver loyalty either. It's not like Uber has, you know, the best drivers exclusively and it's a massive fleet. It, you know, all of these drivers use multiple apps at the same time. So there's no loyalty. Customers can own, you know, download all of the apps and look at which has the cheapest delivery. So there's no, there's nothing unique. There's nothing, not, not in a major way, I don't think. Yeah. Um, and you've seen between some the apps. Yeah. And you've seen some businesses kind of realize this now that they don't really have a great business model and they've tried to kind of work around that by doing different things in that ecosystem like a lot of them now have subscription models where you pay a, a weekly or a monthly subscription but even even that doesn't escape the problem because when you're looking at these kind of when you're looking at these kind of apps if i bought a subscription to this i'm i'm not necessarily buying a subscription for you know better food you know Maybe I'll buy a subscription for better food. Probably not. But really, if you're buying a subscription for for one of these things, it's so that you can get things even cheaper. Like that's why you're <laughs> getting the subscription. So even though you're yeah. paying a subscription fee, the idea is that you're hopefully going to make that money back. So that's that's like the whole reason for getting the subscription, which makes it even worse for the app because all their transactions already don't make money. So even if they do more transactions they're making even less money. So it just doesn't it just doesn't quite work. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess their hope is, you know, there's a ton of people who have the subscription and don't order anything and those people subsidize exactly. their heavy. But, but but the problem is it's, the, I mean, the subscription, what is it like? Uber is like $10, $12 a month or something. Like yeah. with delivery fees now, $5, $6, uh, that's like two deliveries a month. Yeah. Um, so even if you're just a pretty normal uber eats person maybe you get something on a friday once a week you're already hurting uber by, by you know like twice the delivery fees by having yeah. a subscription and that's just so it's too low um but no one's going to pay you know 30 dollars a month for, for free delivery no. from uber but it, no. it that, that that is exactly the point it just it the economics just it doesn't work uh there's yeah. too many people that need to get their need to get their cut yeah Exactly right, Hamish. Anyway, that's all I had to say. That's just a quick, more of a headline than anything. <laughs> they've, they've now burnt $20 billion collectively, Hamish, those businesses, but uh, pretty wild. All right, take us home, yeah, it's mate. Be, take us home. Well, I was just going to say on that point, it, it is going to be interesting to see kind of what happens with these businesses because, uh, you know, there's things like drone delivery that'll potentially, um, you know, I, it's a, it's a sad thing to say, but like, if, you know, if it can eliminate the driver element, at least that's one less party that, you know, is, is taking money out of that equation. Not to say that, that, you know, that's a good thing. Obviously that's kind of sad, but that's probably, you know, one direction some of these companies can go over the super long term mm. is, is having drone delivery. Um, but yeah, it, it is going to be interesting to, to see how long they just eat losses before they before um, yeah. you know something happens, we've we've seen Deliveroo. I think in Australia went bankrupt a couple mm. years ago already. Um, yeah. So so yeah, it's been it's been tough. It is a tough tough environment for the um, for these apps. But yes, we'll see what happens. Yeah. We'll see what happens. All right, Hamish, tell me, bring us home. Tell me about the world of orange juice, my friend. Yeah, this is the most important story of the week, of course. No, again, this this is just kind of a this is a very short. Um, short story that I, that I saw there. Um, and I know a few weeks ago we commented on, um, some supply constraints in the kind of the chocolate market and how kind of chocolate prices have been rising significantly. And I saw this story and I thought, Oh, well, here's another, uh, interesting, not related at all, but, uh, uh, uh another kind of story in, in a similar vein. Um, and that's that orange juice prices have reached another all time high, uh, amid ongoing supply constraints, orange juice futures. <laughs> yep, that's a that's a thing. Orange, you, you want to? <laughs> so what do you do for a living? Oh, uh, you know, I just trade orange juice futures. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm an, I'm an expert on orange juice prices. Uh. <laughs> I'm forecasting orange juice. Um, 
So yeah, I mean that's a it's a thing. I mean obviously it's a thing. It, there, there, there's obviously orange juice companies and they they need to stabilize their prices, so they use these contracts. But it's still funny, just this idea that there's like a you know an orange juice like oh we got yeah apple futures. I'm, just, I'm a I'm an apple. I'm a grape. I'm a grape futures trader. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's so funny. But, uh, yeah, so orange juice futures reached four dollars and seventy seven cents per pound this week, which was double the price from twelve months ago. So. Um, uh, the, the price of wow. orange juice at the supply side has been rising a lot. And uh, it comes down to basically supply constraints. Um, orange output in Florida has been uh, declining. Uh, and then more importantly, climate-fueled extreme weather has been hurting orange production in Brazil, which is the largest exporter of orange juice. Oh. Uh, so excessive heat. Uh, has uh, has meant Brazil is on track for one of its worst harvests in 30 years. Oh right! So uh, it's too wow. hot for the for for the for the poor oranges. They're forecasting 232.4 million boxes of oranges in the 2024-2025 season, which would be a 24% decline year over year. Wow! Mm. There you go. Uh, I, I, I thought Harry, that my orange yeah. juice was a little bit more watery lately. <laughs> well, that, that's actually funny you say that because Harry Campbell, uh, a commodity market uh, data analyst at research group uh, Mintech, said that soaring orange juice prices have forced manufacturers and blenders to adapt to the situation by considering alternative fruit juices, such as water. <laughs> the, a little bit of so, dilution. Yeah. A little bit of dilution. Uh, I'll have to, I'll yeah. have to put half, half orange juice, half water. Yeah, we've got a new blend. <laughs> uh, he said, uh, a lot of them will be changing the quantities of juice they are putting into their blends to drop the orange juice and increase other juices, uh, such as pear juice, apple juice, grape juice, uh, so they are less reliant on the orange juice. Um, mm. So That makes so, sense for so those blends, go. but it is hard for orange juice because orange juice... <laughs> Is just oranges. It's, it's kind of in the name. Yeah. It is if, in you, the if, you name. Start putting, if you start putting apple juice in there, people might exactly. notice that one. It's fine if it's like tropical or breakfast juice or something like that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. once you start drifting into the realm of orange juice, there's a limited limited amount you can do there. <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely want to be in the tropical juice business because no one <laughs> no one's thinking twice about what's in that. I mean, there's a, you know there's a couple of there's a couple of things on the label, but have you ever yeah. thought about the percentage breakdown? Like they can no. shift. You know, if apples are having a good harvest, they can go eighty <laughs> yeah. percent apples. Pineapples well, this year, yeah, like whatever yeah, you want. It's basically, an apple juice now, yeah. <laughs> uh, so so that, that's really all I have for this story basically the, it looks like this is going to be kind of an ongoing problem it, increases in extreme weather in Brazil have been increasing for some time so prices right. are expected to continue rising um, so yeah make sure you're betting on those uh, orange juice oil future <laughs> orange juice futures, orange juice futures. <laughs> lol yeah. it just doesn't even roll off the top <laughs> orange juice futures it doesn't no, uh, it doesn't, doesn't have I, the same ring no no, one day I, I want to be able to say that at a party. What do you do? I trade uh, orange juice futures. Nothing yeah. major, you know. Well, I mean, it's good yeah. business at the moment, but you know, yeah. yeah. You know, you know cab cabbage futures, you know. Cabbage futures. Nothing, nothing crazy. <laughs> Brussels sprout Broccolini futures. futures. <laughs> <laughs> Broccolini futures. <laughs> uh, all right, Hamish, that's enough. That's <laughs> enough. All right, let's bounce out of here, guys. That is all we've got for today. Yeah. Thanks very much for tuning in. As always, we, we do appreciate you guys giving us uh, the hour of your time each and every week. We hope you enjoyed today's somewhat looser episode. <laughs> <laughs> Hamish's fraud story of the week makes its triumphant return. Orange juice is going bananas and, and Trump's yeah. in, a, in a bit of trouble. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good episode. All right, guys, we're yeah. going to bounce out of here. Thanks very much for tuning in. Thanks, Hamish, as always, for joining me. And we'll see you guys next no week. Worries. See you guys.